Well, greetings and blessings to you, my friends, my family members, brothers and sisters in Christ. I just want to thank you for joining us this week for our Bible study. We took a, a break last week for Thanksgiving, and I hope that you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Uh, but I'm so excited to be back with our Bible study. So I'm thankful that uh, you decided to join us. Amen for this Bible study. And I'm excited because this particular scripture uh, that we're about to go into is a very dear account to me. Uh, it is an account where we see the faith of someone who is uh, not a Jew and his faith, Jesus says, is greater than all of Israel. OK, so when I see scriptures like that, scriptures that catches Jesus uh, that catch Jesus' attention, it really makes me want to pay attention because I want to be able to uh, do or display what these people display that catch Jesus' uh, attention. Uh, this man in our scripture today, like the woman with the issue of blood, caused Jesus to marvel. And this is something that is a blessing. We've been in Matthew chapter number eight as we continue to walk through the earthly ministry of Jesus. And I want to do something uh, just a little bit different on today. Our scripture picks up in Matthew chapter number eight, verses five through 13. But what I want to do is I want to read the account that is in Luke chapter seven, verses one through um, nine. OK, so. Actually, 1 through 10, Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. This is what I want to read. It's the same account, but what I want to tell you the difference is in Matthew chapter number 8, it says that the centurion, uh, it, well, it reads like the centurion came to Jesus. Okay, but what Luke records about what happened, it's not a contradiction. It's just the interpretation of what's being written. Okay, but what Luke actually records my goodness, it gives us detail that we dare not miss. So instead of continuing to talk, let us read the scriptures, Luke chapter seven, verses one through 10. And let's dig out of this text what we can. OK, verse one. Now, when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum and a certain centurion's, ser centurion's servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. When he had heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. That's a detail Matthew doesn't record. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. Another detail Matthew doesn't record. For he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him. Another detail Matthew doesn't record, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself. Check this out. For I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Wherefore, here's another detail. Neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee. Okay, that clears it up. Whether he came to Jesus himself or whether he sent others, Luke records that he says, I thought I myself, uh, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word and my servant shall be healed. Praise God. For I also am a man set unto a thorough authority, having under me soldiers. And I say unto one, go and he goeth and to another come and he cometh and to my servant do this and he doeth it. When Jesus heard these sayings, he marveled at him and turned him about and said uh, unto the people that follow him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And they that were sent, returning to the house, found the servant whole that had been sick. I want to focus in this text on... Um, the fact that I am not worthy. OK, I, I, I want to deal with this word worthy from this text, but let's let's just walk through the scriptures. 
won't take but a few minutes, but I really want to uh, drive home the point uh, of this particular passage. Now, in Matthew chapter number eight, we're we're going to see a series of different healings. And in the same chapter of Luke chapter seven, we're going to see a series of healings. And Matthew is going to give us a detail uh, about these healings that um, I want us to pay attention to, Lord's willing, next week. But in this particular case, there is a Roman centurion. This Roman centurion would be over uh, multiple soldiers. I can't give you the exact number of soldiers that this person would have been over, but he is an officer in the Roman army, and he's got soldiers under him. Some would say hundreds of soldiers under him. Now, the thing about this soldier that we see in the text is that he's got a heart for his servant, where you'll find a lot of people who have servants really don't care about the servant, and they can say, well, I can always get somebody else to uh, fulfill your role. This particular centurion has compassion on his servant. Okay, so this servant is about to die, and there are people in Jerusalem, well, not in Jerusalem, but in Capernaum, uh, in the area where Jesus has done a lot of his ministry, a lot of his teaching and preaching. There are people in this, this city who uh, they favor this Roman centurion. You're not going to find someone of Rome who shows compassion on the Jewish people. Uh, you're not going to find someone who uh, really cares about their religion. It's really all about Rome. It's about Caesar. And Rome carries this certain uh, air of pride about them, you understand, because they are the world power. But here we have a Roman centurion who has a servant. He has compassion on the servant. And these Jews, uh, uh, they, they think highly of him. So uh, apparently they tell this centurion about the things that Jesus has been able to do. Again, this right here is really the headquarters of Jesus' earthly ministry. So there's a lot to tell about what Jesus has taught, a lot to tell about the things that Jesus has done. So the Bible says when this centurion hears about Jesus, he does not send for one of Rome's doctors. Okay? Okay. Again, if Rome had this particular air of pride, they would be able to say, well, we've got the best doctors. No, he doesn't send for a Roman doctor. He doesn't look to Roman medicine, but he hears about this healer. Oh, my goodness. Named Jesus. And he figures that if anybody can help my servant, I believe Jesus can do it. Yeah, this man had never shaken hand with Jesus. He's never, he hasn't met Jesus because the scripture says, verse three, when he heard of Jesus. Faith starts by hearing, does it not? That's what Romans chapter number 10 says. Faith cometh by hearing. This man believed what he heard. He didn't have to have a front seat to Jesus' uh, sermon. He didn't have a front seat, didn't have to have a front seat to Jesus's healings. It was not his business to go around and follow Jesus. It was his business to uh, uh, to command the army, the soldiers that he was over. So this man could not leave his post to follow Jesus around. So all he had to do is hear about Jesus. And when what he heard was enough for him to believe that this Jesus can heal my servant. I want to stop here for just a few seconds and ask you, do you really have to see what Jesus can do before you believe him? Or do you just believe what you've heard? Do you believe what you've read? Do you believe that he's the same God that we read about in the Bible? Do you believe that the God who parted the Red Sea is the God who lives in me? Ha <laughs> ha! Do you believe that the God who rolled away the waters of the Jordan River, he's the same God? Do you believe that the God who spoke from a burning bush, he's the same God today? Do you believe the God who healed the sick, who raised the dead, he is the same God? And if you believe that, 
We said on Sunday in Romans chapter number eight that the same spirit that raised Jesus up the, from the dead, he is the same spirit that shall quicken our mortal bodies and he dwells within us. Praise God. He's the same God. He's not weaker. He's not stronger because he's incapable, amen, of being any more or less than he is when he's already all powerful, all seeing and all knowing. He is all sufficient. Amen. And he is the same God that we have today. Do you believe that he's the same God? This Roman centurion heard about the things that Jesus had done and he believed. Amen. So this is where faith began. It began with him hearing about Jesus. But James says, show me your faith by your works. So if he believes then his faith is going to prompt him to do some things. Let's look in the scripture at what faith has encouraged this man to do. The first thing that he does is he sends elders of the Jews to beg Jesus that he would come and heal his servant. Now, it's bigger than faith causes this man to ask Jesus for help. Faith, what faith did for this Roman centurion is the same thing that we found out faith did to a leper a couple of weeks back. Faith humbles this man. See, we we look at faith today and, and, and we want to uh, flex our faith muscles in front of people and act like, because I believe harder than you, I'm going to get more blessings than you. But the first thing that faith ought to do is ought to put you in your place. Oh, hallelujah. You can write that down. Faith ought to put you in your place, in your proper place. Faith in this Jesus caused this man to see himself in such a perspective that he's not worthy himself to go to Jesus. This is the reason why the leper two weeks ago came to Jesus worshiping because his faith in Jesus put him in his proper place. Oh my goodness. Lord, I love it. I love it. The reason why we know that it put this man in his proper place, I can go ahead and go down to verse number seven when he says, wherefore neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee. You can look through the scriptures. And you can find that when people have a realization of who God is, what it does is it, it actually shines a light on who I am. Isaiah, in the year the king Uzziah died, saw the Lord high and lifted up in the vision, his train filled the temple. And all of these things that he sees, these beasts, these creatures around, this praise that he hears, it causes him to reflect on himself. And he says, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. So he says, I don't deserve to be here. I'm not worthy to be here. Praise God. Peter, the apostle Peter, before he's apostle, he's fisherman Peter. Jesus is preaching on the seashore. So many people, he gets on the boat. He starts preaching. Then he says, Peter, lunch out into the deep. There's a miracle that's about to happen. Peter's been fishing all night. Jesus says, cast your net out there on this side. Peter says, Lord, we've been fishing all night. This is, this is our trade. I know you're a carpenter. And we're fishermen. But hey, listen, nevertheless, at your word, I'm going to obey you. I'm going to do what you say. And there's this great miracle where they begin to pull up this net and they can't do it. There's so many fish in this net that they begin popping the strings, popping the, 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 the cords of the net. And they have to ask James and John, amen, and their father Zebedee in the other boat to help them. And it says that so many fish were in this net that it began to sink both ships. And what happens is Peter drops down to his knees and he says, you've got to get off my boat. Because I'm not worthy to be in your presence. I am a sinner. See, when you really come to the actualization of who Jesus is, it doesn't prompt you to pride. It doesn't promote you. huh? It demotes you. 
It causes you to see yourself in, 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 your, in, in the light. The light of Jesus of knowing who he is should humble you. That's what faith should do if you really believe who he is, which means you got to believe that he's more than just a healer. We're going to find that out in just a, a couple of minutes, that he's more than just a healer. So if you're just looking at Jesus as a healer and the grantor of your wishes, you will not be humble in his presence. You'll demand that he do things for you. You'll start to think that you are owed certain things from him. All right, we'll get to that just a minute. I promise we'll be done. But faith ought to humble you and put you in your proper position. Faith calls this man not just to get some Jews, but to get the elders of the Jews to go to Jesus. Why? Because this is the most respectful way that this man sees that he can approach Jesus. He doesn't just get your average day person. He gets the ones that all of the Jews in this area respect. He gets those to go to him, to Jesus, because he thinks, well, maybe, maybe they're worthy to get in his presence. But then he puts a stop to that. Before that, this is what happens. These elders get to Jesus. And these elders start to state the case for this Roman centurion. They say that this centurion is worthy of Jesus performing this miracle for him. Then they begin to look at his resume. They say that, hey, he loves us. He loves our nation. He's a friend of the Jews. And he even built us a synagogue. They, they gave uh, an honorable mention. He loves our nation. We love him. And he built us a church. See, we make a mistake when we go before the Lord acting like we deserve something from the Lord. And we start to state our case. We start to go through our resume and tell the Lord what it is that we deserve of him. We start to, to go through the things that we have done for him. And we start to say that, hey, I, I did this. I did this. You ought to do this. Can I tell you the only thing that we're worthy of? Death. Because let me tell you something. The things that we do for the Lord, we shouldn't be doing for the Lord. We should be doing them unto the Lord. I'm going to tell you what the difference is. When you are doing things unto the Lord, it is a sacrifice unto the Lord. It is an offering to the Lord. But when you're doing things for the Lord, you're performing. Uh, just, you know, sometimes we ought to watch our words. And I know there's some people that are saying, well, it really doesn't take all that. But no, no, no. It's about a mindset. It's about training your mindset. We're not performing for the Lord so he can throw us a couple of peanuts for doing a good performance. What you really deserve is death. The wages of sin is death. Didn't you sin? All right, then. Salvation is a gift. It's not earned. Grace is God's unmerited favor. His loving kindness toward us that we cannot earn. You can never earn it because you are a sinner, because I am a sinner. So everything that we receive from the Lord, we receive it by grace. You can never go to God and say that you're worthy of something that he has to offer unto you. There's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can give that says that you are worthy of something from God. Even people that we pray to on behalf, uh, uh, we pray to God on behalf of them. You know, I've even made this mistake of saying, God, this person deserves this. You know, they've done this. They've done that. They've done this for me. But no, even the sweetest and kindest of us, even the oldest of us deserve death. We all deserve death. See, when uh, we go to one another and we reason like that and say that this person did this for you, they deserve for you to return the favor. Yeah. Yeah. Because we can meet and even exceed one another's standards. But you can never meet or exceed God's standards because God's standard is pure perfection and holiness and you can never meet it. No, not in his flesh. You can never meet his standard. So the only thing that we're worthy of is death. These Jews, these elders come to Jesus, say that this man is worthy uh, and Jesus actually proceeds to go. Right. So. Before they get to the house. They're not far from the house. 
This Roman centurion does something amazing. He still doesn't leave the house and go to Jesus and say what he's about to say. He sends some friends out. And this is what he says to Jesus. He says, I am not worthy that you should even come in my house. And I didn't even think that I was worthy to even stand before you face to face. So he's acknowledging that Jesus is more than just a healer. He's acknowledging that Jesus is a holy man. His faith in Jesus puts him in a proper perspective where he recognizes that Jesus is more than just a healer. Listen at what he says. He says, I am also a man under authority. And I tell this person this and they have to do it. And I tell this person go there and they have to go there. I've got soldiers under me and whatever I tell them to do, they do it. You are more than a healer. You are a man of authority. And what you have to understand about Jesus's authority is that he has authority over more than just sicknesses. He has authority over spirits. He has authority over all things. The Bible declares that he has created all things for his purpose. He is what the Bible calls the Lord of hosts. He is the Lord of all creation. He is the Lord over things not created because he can speak to nothing and make everything just like the word made flesh did in Genesis chapter number one. He is the Lord of all and whatever he speaks to has to stand in line. So I want to leave you with this, this, this encouragement about this, just a side note that whatever it is that's going on in your life, Jesus is Lord over it. It may seem to have the upper hand on you. It may seem to have control over you, but whatever the situation is, Jesus has control over it. So this centurion says that you're more than a healer. You are Lord. And whatever you say has to happen. He says, speak the word and it shall be done. This thing marvels Jesus because there's no one else who has Express this type of faith in Jesus. There's no one else who has humbled themselves before the Lord, have put themselves in the proper place, have expressed such great humility that they themselves don't go to Jesus begging or demanding from Jesus, but sins, uh, 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 intercessors or sins, uh, mediators on their behalf to ask Jesus to do something. And then he expresses the fact that Jesus has all authority and whatever he says has got to fall in line. This marvels Jesus. Let me leave you with this and we're done. Faith should put you in your proper perspective, your proper place. Faith should give you a humility before the Lord. And we should never have the gall to speak in such a way that God owes us something because God actually gave us what we owed. None of us would be here. We should be thankful that we are under his grace, that he would be so kind to us as to grant us what we ask. When he says, your word abide in me and, you, and, 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 my, and my, my words abide in you and you abide in me, he said, you will ask whatever you will and it shall be done. For you, that's grace. That's loving kindness. Oh, what a God that we serve. There's no other faith that anyone has expressed as great as this Roman centurion has. No one in all of Jerusalem that has expressed this faith. And they have the scriptures. They've seen the miracles, yet still not one of them have expressed this type of faith. Friends, Faith is more than just believing. Faith will line you up and will cause you to come to God properly. Amen. And your faith, praise God, opens the doors to the impossible. Let our faith humble us because we're not worthy. But Jesus is able. Praise God. God bless you, Lord Winner. We'll see you again on next week. And we may have a week or two before our Christmas uh, holiday break. Praise God. But I thank you for joining us for these words. Amen. God bless you. Hope to see you next week.